Uh, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this project of oral narratives of Latinos in Ohio. Today is Tuesday, December 17th. Uh, 20... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Today is Tuesday, December 15th, uh, 2020. Uh, can we start with your full names, please? Uh, my name is Nidia Esther Romero Guzman. Henry Guzman. Tell me where, um, where you grew up. Well, um, let me just give you a little history. Okay. okay. Um, my father came from Puerto Rico in 1947 to Youngstown, Ohio, to work in the steel mills. Um, uh, he uh, married my mother in 1946, seven, and I was born in 1948 making my father the first Puerto Rican man to come to Youngstown to work. Mm. And I was the first Puerto Rican baby born uh, in Youngstown. My brother was born 10 months later. <laughs> um, my mother uh, at that time, prior to getting married, uh, she uh, worked, she tra uh, transferred from uh, Puerto Rico to New York mm -hmm. to work in the handkerchief factory. And that's where my mom and my dad met and then they got married. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we, um, my parents, uh, since they were the first Puerto Ricans here, as people came to work, men came to work, left their families behind in Puerto Rico. Uh, they were bilingual, first of all, which was an advantage in those days. Uh, my father and my mother would take in the men. They had nowhere to stay, so they would take them into their home. <laughs> And uh, my mother would cook for them, wash their clothes, fix their lunches, mm -hmm. and they would go to work. And when they were able to bring their families in, they found housing, which my father helped a lot, uh, being able to speak to um, in English. He helped them a lot find uh, places to live and, and, and to orient them to the area. Mm -hmm. um, uh, then Henry's family came. So <laughs> I met Henry when I was three. And he was five. Wow. <laughs> yes, she used to. They used to come over. The families back then, because family and church was what we were surrounded with. Uh, we spent a lot of time with the early families that were around. We and so we visited. We had picnics and things like this. And families were always together. The different families uh, holding events, weddings back then were held in the homes. Uh, the receptions were held in the homes, that kind of thing. Well, holidays so, were in the home. Yeah, yeah. And because everybody left their families behind, mm -hmm. your friends became your family. So really, Henry's family and my family were were family. Mm -hmm. My father was, we are Catholic. My father was Henry's sponsor in confirmation. Mm -hmm. And my parents baptized his, his brother. So we were, my parents were compadres. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Henry... What, why did your family uh, come to Ohio? What was work, I, I suppose? Well, again, as Nidia mentioned, back then, actually, the uh, U.S. Department of Labor had contract with workers with the Department of Labor on the island to bring in contract workers to work in the steel mills. Mm -hmm. the, the steel industry was uh, up and going real strong back then especially in cities like Youngstown, Cleveland, and Lorraine. Mm -hmm. And so Puerto Ricans came in and they went to work primarily in those mills. Mm -hmm. um, so my father was one of those uh, individuals that came to work and he came by himself. And so uh, a year later, after he established himself, found a place to live, he sent for my mother and my two sisters and, and me. And uh, we came over um, um, uh, as a family. And that's how... He came to be in Youngstown, mm -hmm. and that was to work in the steel mills. And he worked. Uh, it was hard, uh, laborious work. I mean, it was um, that you didn't need to speak the language. All you needed was a strong back and a willingness to work. And, of course, uh, they came. And during that time, the Korean War was still going on. Mm -hmm. So there was a shortage of males to work in these mills. So that's why uh, they came in from the island. Right. Uh, tell me about your childhood growing up there. You said it was very uh, centered around family and, and the church. But tell me about just, you know, the day-to-day -day school. What's, it, what's really funny, you know, Spanish was our first language. Right. Okay. Uh, my brother and I, because we were 10 months apart, we entered school at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the cutoff. 
And so I remember this one instance. Um, my parents got, we went into kindergarten and my parents received a letter from the teacher encouraging my parents to speak to us in English because we would speak in half English and half Spanish in kindergarten. Mm-hmm. The teacher didn't understand. So, you know, having said that, Spanish was our first language and then we did learn our English. Um, I, I went to a Catholic um, elementary school mm-hmm. and then... Um, I, my brother and I were competitors. We were both pretty good students. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did go to Youngstown City Schools um, as we grew up and graduated from South High, High School in Youngstown. I went on to nursing school and my brother went to college and became a lawyer. And then I have two older brothers and uh, two older sisters, but that's a different story. <laughs> They're my half brothers and my half sisters, and then I also have an adopted sister. And um, uh, my childhood was surrounded by Spanish-speaking people. Um, our culture, our food, mm-hmm. our music, our um, the personalities were wonderful. We we're a very a loving community, mm-hmm. which still exists. Um, we we look forward to the weekends because everybody works so hard during the week. And on Saturdays, it was, you know, you, you clean your house, you take your showers, and then you go visiting. Mm-hmm. And Sundays after church, you always visited people. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a known fact. It, maybe this Sunday would be at my parents' house. Mm-hmm. And the next Sunday would be at his parents' house. But we would go there and you cook and you eat and you laugh. And I mean, I remember on Saturday evenings, his sisters and I would, um, we would cook dirt and, um, yeah. you know. Uh, then they want me to eat. <laughs> yeah, my brother and he were our, our husbands uh-huh. and they would have to come and eat our food. So uh-huh. it was just a lot of fun. Uh-huh. Playing hide and go seek till it's yeah. dark, mm-hmm. uh, catching lightning bugs. Mm-hmm. You know, we were outside all the time. Mm-hmm. I, I had a very uh, wonderful childhood. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, um, our, our home was very patriarchal which was typical for a uh, Latino family mm-hmm. in those days. Very, and, you know, my mm-hmm. dad was the breadwinner. He made the decisions. He was loving, but very strict, mm-hmm. you know. So um, it, w- it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Yeah, and mine, mine was similar. I mean, I, I um, again, uh, when I arrived from Puerto Rico, it was wintertime. And I remember as a young man um, being in this house, that the fur- coal furnaces at the time, that's what we had. And I was standing over this um, uh, grate that was on the floor and the heat came up from it. And I started to scream because I thought the house was on fire. <laughs> and so that was all new to us because obviously we didn't have that on the island. And so, and, and I remember then going on to school, uh, again, not speaking um, uh, English and the teacher pounding on the desk that you needed to forget your Spanish because you're in America now and we speak only English here. Mm -hmm. And I would run home from school almost twice a week. School was close to where we lived. Mm -hmm. I would leave and I would run home and my father would take me back to school. Mm -hmm. Um, And he would, I would do that several times and he would just take me back to school. Mm -hmm. I finally figured out, well, I might as well just stay here because this isn't working. (laughs) Um, But yeah, and, 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 uh, uh, but interesting enough, I remember uh, when my dad first took me uh, to school to sign me up for classes and presented my birth certificate. Um, they, uh, the teacher back then, or someone in the school, and my dad didn't speak very much English, mm-hmm. and of course I didn't speak any. And um, she or he, I uh, scratched out, um, Enrique was on my birth certificate mm-hmm. and wrote Henry. So from there on, I was Henry, but the only, and my real name is Enrique. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, we were going to go to Europe years later. Once we were married, we were going to Europe and I had, we had to get, try to get our uh, passports and I, they wouldn't issue me one. (laughs) We had tickets already, Mm -hmm. but I couldn't get my passport. I had to write 
get an attorney to help me out, mm -hmm. write to the, the church in Puerto Rico, maintain better records than the Department of Health than the government did. So we got a certificate from Puerto Rico. I had to get some th witnesses to verify, sign affidavits that Henry and Enrique were one and the same. Mm -hmm. So finally submit all that paperwork to to the department, uh, State Department and finally, um, or the Department of Naturalization, I think it was, and finally got the, the passport. Wow, that's yeah. interesting, mm -hmm. very, very interesting. <laughs> but, um, and then yeah, as you know, uh, foreign language was a requirement in the, in the colleges. And mm -hmm. so I remember going to college and they said, you need a foreign language in order to graduate. And I said to them, well, you know, the teachers are telling me that I didn't need in a, a foreign language anymore because I'm in the USA. Now you want me to pay you so you can teach me a foreign language that I had. <laughs> so it was that kind of thing. They didn't right. quite talk to each other right. very well. But. Right, right. There's a lot of things that sometimes don't make sense. <laughs> right, right. Um, our, our household was um, uh, very uh, much into education. Mm -hmm. My father went to the 10th grade. My mother went to the 8th grade, but they were both bilingual. Um, they were probably pretty good students, but in those days, you know, you reach a certain point and you had to help the family. Right. Uh, so they always encouraged us to further our education. Mm -hmm. And there was no doubt in my mind what I wanted to be. I used to read uh, Sue Barton books because my life... I just loved the library, and I read all the time. And Sue Barton was a, a character, a nurse character. Sometimes she was a surgical nurse. Sometimes she was a public health nurse, and and that just inspired me to become a nurse. You know, so. Do you uh, both of you? Do you have brothers and sisters? You've mentioned some. So how many brothers or sisters? I I have uh, two older sisters, mm -hmm. two two older brothers. They're half half brothers mm -hmm. and half sisters. Um, and then I have an adopted sister. Mm -hmm. Now my mother, uh, the boys, my two older brothers, their mother passed away mm -hmm. and my mother raised them. Okay. And they were little, they were six and seven mm -hmm. uh, when their mother passed away. And then my parents were then married after that. Mm -hmm. And so my mother raised those two boys. Mm -hmm. And then my sister that was adopted came into our lives when she was six and I was eight, uh, she was um, in an orphanage with Catholic Charities, and my father was very involved in Catholic Charities. Mm -hmm. He was on um, committees, and he was a community leader. And uh, they asked if this little girl could come on the weekends and and spend the weekend with the family. And of mm -hmm. course, my parents, we had four kids already. What's another kid? So. <laughs> She would come and on the weekend, and one weekend she just refused to go with the social mm -hmm. worker, and she screamed and yelled, and she stayed, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so she was adopted. Yeah. So and then you I, were about the middle child, then I guess. Then um. Maybe. Yeah, I was a middle child. <laughs> yeah, but for a lot of years I was the only girl. Right. I had a younger brother and two older brothers, and now, and now we have a sister. So yeah. <laughs> so I was a middle child. <laughs> so. I have uh, two sisters that were born in Puerto Rico, and of course I was. And then I have a uh, another sister that was born here in the States and a brother uh, born in the States. So a middle child, too. Uh, well, am I a middle well, child? He, no. he, he's the second oldest. Yeah, okay. I'm the second so oldest. So he really isn't yeah. a middle child. Nancy is. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the second oldest. Okay. <laughs> um, tell me about... Um, that life of uh, brothers and sisters, uh, were there any activities that you remember doing together, um, you know, between brothers and sisters? Um, and were there some sort of, um, I mean, you, you mentioned that your family was very patriarchal. So uh, was it that the, you as the only woman, were you, did you have different chores than your brothers or, you know? <laughs> well, I, okay, so because I was the only girl I was told that I was spoiled. I mean, I don't get that at all. What do you think, Henry? What do you think? I think so. <laughs> yeah. um, my brothers had, my older brothers had outdoor chores. Mm -hmm. They had to cut the grass, cut the hedges. Mm -hmm. um, me as a girl, um, 
Well, you have your mother with the dishes. Yeah, and things I mean, like I was this. in the kitchen with my mother all the time. Yeah. You know, and that's you know, I learned how to cook from her, and um, I can't really say that. I mean, I would help dust mm -hmm. or sweep the floor, but I was young until we were became teenagers. We moved into the Youngstown com community from a little town, uh, a su little suburb from Youngstown called Camel. Mm -hmm. We moved into Youngstown. Then my two older brothers had left already because they were older and they went into the military. So then it was left with my younger brother and my younger sister. And yeah, we had chores. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to wash the dishes and we had to mop the floor. Mm -hmm. The girls. Mm -hmm. Then my brother had to take out the trash, mm -hmm. had to cut the grass. Yeah. So, you know, it was typical boys do this and girls do this. So, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. We had to fix our bed every day. Mm -hmm. Could not leave the house without fixing the bed <laughs> or we would hear it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and consequently, we, we'd still do that, right? Yeah. With us, the last one out of bed has to fix the bed. And guess who fixes it every day? I do. <laughs> like yeah. So my, my situation was, um, I remember as a, a, a child, um, we had, I mentioned we had a cold furnace. Mm -hmm. And so one of my chores was to make sure during the night, the furnace had to, you know, you had to stoke the furnace. In other words, you had to go down in the basement and shovel coal and put it into the furnace. Otherwise, it will go off in the wintertime. So that was a winter chore. Um, and I, my sister and I both switched off because my oldest sister and I, we were responsible during the night to make sure that the furnace was um, was going. And that was a winter chore. And then in the summer times, obviously, is it's outdoor stuff, cutting grass. Uh, my father had a garden. So helping him in the garden during the summertime, he used to, because he had gardens and farms in, in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. he used to love to garden here. Mm -hmm. And so planting corn, planting vegetables, mm -hmm. tomatoes, planting more than what he could ever use. <laughs> and it was always to give away. And so you know, we reaped the benefits of oh, it yeah, because he, was always, he would always bring us food. Always, always to plant for everybody else, you know, so, mm -hmm. but always helping with those kind of things. Right. right. Um, tell me about, um, was, uh, what kind of things, uh, activities did you do to get together? And I, and I love that you said that on the weekends, um, you went to visit family mm -hmm. and many times, I'm sure each other's families as well. Uh, so tell me about this, um, maybe activities that did, did, did it change, um, in the seasons? Was there different activities that you did over the summer? Did you visit Puerto Rico? often um during you know breaks school breaks or something like that well with us i remember so we have this amusement park in youngstown called idora park and it had um, believe it or not it had a weight it it was very big for us when we were little but as when we were as adults <laughs> it was a very small amusement park but there was in the middle of it there was a wading pool mm -hmm. and i i have memories of so because my dad worked a lot and then he wanted to spend time with the family, mm -hmm. um, we would go to Idora Park a lot mm -hmm. and we would go into the waiting pool or ride the rides. You know, that was one of the things that we did. A lot of the times um, he, my dad would just say, OK, everybody get in the car. Where are we going? And he used to always say, Baja Boom. <laughs> <laughs> And it's like, okay, but where, what is that? And, you know, he, it was just a saying he said. And we would go for rides in the country and always stop at, um, an, like, an ice cream place and get an ice cream cone. And that was a treat. Um, we didn't go on, except for one time, we went on a vacation. And actually what it was, my parents were, bapt uh, were married in a Baptist church. And... Uh, uh, like six years after, seven years after they were married in the Baptist church and they then became very um, involved in the Catholic church, mm -hmm. the priest wanted them to be married in the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. So they were, I went to my parents' wedding <laughs> <laughs> and they decided to go on a honeymoon to, mm -hmm. to Niagara Falls. So they packed up all the four kids and we all like, went to like my whole family. <laughs> we all went to Niagara Falls oh. on their honeymoon. Mm -hmm. But we never went on a vacation because first of all, there were five of us that my dad was their sole supporter mm -hmm. and didn't make a lot of money to support, you know, five children. So we didn't do that. But we did a lot, like you said, like I said, 
lot of visiting. Um, my parents and, and his parents were very involved in the AMVETS. You know what that is, right? American veterans. Okay. And so they had, it, it was a group of veterans, of Latino veterans. Mm-hmm. And so they would uh, sponsor picnics to get money, mm-hmm. sponsor picnics um, with dancing. Mm-hmm. They'd rent a, a hall, uh, an outdoor hall like and called Willow Ranch. And um, the, all the ladies, auxiliary ladies, uh, the wives of the American vet would do all the cooking mm-hmm. and roast pigs and then they'd hire a band and during the day we would eat and at night we would dance mm-hmm. so you know there was always community activities to do our church had festivals mm-hmm. um so that's what we grew up with mm-hmm. and we very had, um, close and we had um uh, get together at that lakes so there was a lake called lake milton yeah so we would and go yankee there lake. yankee lake well we would go there as families mm-hmm. several families would have uh, go there on Sundays or Saturdays. Yeah, they and, would plan it, and you know, and everybody would bring food, and we'd spend the whole day after church because we would go to ten o'clock mass, and then we would go, by noon we were at the lake. Everybody shared food, and I mean, there weren't very very many vacations, um, mm-hmm. at least from my family. Ours uh, either. We, um, my dad worked double shifts. Mm-hmm. He'd work a, a, a eight to three and three to eleven uh, shift. Uh, and My so also. double shifts. And so he worked, I mean, they spent a lot of time working. Right. And so I, as a child, I don't remember going, to, I do remember a trip to New York when we were really small mm-hmm. to see, uh, my, my aunts, my mother's sisters, um, uh, to New York, but that's basically it other than the little get togethers that we had as families, but uh, to go away somewhere for vacations, that no. was unheard of. And not too many of the families did that back then no. either. Another thing that bring this brought to mind is that we would go to Lorraine a lot mm-hmm. because we had family in Lorraine mm-hmm. and friends in Lorraine. So it would be, okay, after church, we're going to go to Lorraine and we're going to spend a day there, we'll drive, you know, two hours mm-hmm. and, and visit and eat, and, you know, and then drive back home and start the week again. So we visiting. Mm-hmm. Family yeah. and friends was the big thing then. And, you know, not everybody had a phone, so you just show up. Right. <laughs> and it's like, oh, come on in. I have food. You know, it's like you make a big pot of rice and everybody can eat, you know. Good thing you were Puerto Ricans, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't have to make that plan. <laughs> well, you know, that's really funny because even now, if I know somebody's coming, I cook right away. It's like... You didn't have to cook. Oh yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, she doesn't know how to cook for just a small. She makes like a oh. big pot of, of of rice and beans, and and it's like, oh my god. Then I'm I'm eating rice and beans for the whole week. You know. <laughs> Thank That's goodness. No, no, no. It's Thank not. goodness that some of our neighbors are, have grown accustomed to me saying, "Hey, you want some food?" Oh, they've yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, we, um, so. Were the schools that you went to, once you, um, did you go to public school? I went to public school. Uh, Mm -hmm. Once you were in public schools, um, what was that experience like? I mean, you were Puerto Ricanos. Um, I don't know if there were many other Puerto Ricanos in your um, grades or in the schools. How did, what was your experience like? From that lens, from being a Puerto Rican. Yeah, well, let me let me start off. Um, my sister and I, when we came from Puerto Rico, uh, because she had already attended school in Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. um, but we were both both placed in first grade. Mm-hmm. We didn't go to kindergarten, and she would have been going to second grade, but we were both placed in first grade. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and we were the first, uh, there were no other uh, Puerto Rican kids at the time. Mm -hmm. There were others later on, but at the time we were the only ones in the school, in the grade school. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that uh, we hung out together. Um, As I mentioned earlier, I would I would run home from school, (laughs) you know, (laughs) my father, she would stay there. Mm -hmm. Of course, she was afraid to run home. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. Mm -hmm. But but my father would always take me back, you know. But um, yeah, with those experiences like that, the (laughs) teachers didn't understand us. Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't understand them. They didn't understand us. Um, so uh, that that was my early experience with with school. So we lived, and I'm sure that you did too, when you first came. We lived in a little community called Camel. I was saying Camel. Okay, so um, we went to public school in Camel. 
Um, I went a couple years to Catholic school, but then I went to public school. Mm -hmm. Then when I was 12, uh, my father moved us into Youngstown, and we moved to the south side of Youngstown. Very few Latinos there, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, very few. Um, In my class, when I graduated, uh, there were probably 10, no more than 20 Latinos in the school. Henry grew up on the east side of Youngstown, where that's the Latino community, where that's where the church was. And, and so my experience in, a, in public school, um, I became more Americanized mm-hmm. because even though, even though on the weekends we would go to church and we participate in the community, but during the week when I'm in, I was in school, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't there with a lot of Latinos. Mm-hmm. Now, going home, my parents always spoke Spanish. Mm-hmm. We always answered in English. My parents, my mom always cooked Spanish, you know, Puerto Rican food. Mm-hmm. We listened to the, you know, Puerto Rican music. So the culture was always in our home, mm-hmm. always. And then on the weekends... We, you know, we would go into the Latino community now, was Henry. Was church in Spanish also? Mm-hmm. Yes. It was a Puerto Rican. It was, at that time, we called it the Puerto Rican church because there were a few other Latinos there. Mm-hmm. It was mostly Puerto Ricans. And then we, you know, there were a few Mexican families and, yeah. Well, the, um, the, we didn't Central really have, American. we didn't really have a church of our own. Mm-hmm. We used to meet in the basement of different churches or attend. They would have masses. Right. The priests would be bilingual. And they would hold masses for us in in Spanish, mm-hmm. and I remember her brother and my and myself. We were altar boys. We, well, until you know, 1960. Yeah, but but we didn't have our own church. Mm-hmm. It was it was meeting in different. I know. You know, until later on, we organized and we got our own church. We founded uh, a church. Our know. parents, my parents, and his parents, and some of the other Latino men that were around the same age. Mm-hmm. They all came together and they founded the church. Mm-hmm. It was called well, approach the diocese, you know, and mm-hmm. because it was an old uh, Protestant church, mm-hmm. and uh, it was all you know converted into a Catholic church. It was called Santa Rosa de Lima, mm-hmm. and that's where the, then the community started to go to to that particular church. Mm-hmm. And we would have our festivals there, and you know, yeah. um, and that's where we were married, and our children were baptized. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, tell me about, um, so you've mentioned that both your fathers were working, they worked a lot. Tell me about uh, your mothers. Like what, what, what were they involved in? How, what was your, um, you know, sort of their role in the home and in the, in the community? So my father um, was involved with, um, at that time it was called Red Feather. Uh, um, it, it was also called, what was the other name for it? Oh, it, it was, was part of the United Way. It was Red yeah, Feather Agency. Red Feather. So my mother was involved in that. Mm-hmm. Um, my uh, they offered um, classes. Um, United Way offered classes, so my mother took a practical nurse course, mm-hmm. and and passed it, but never took the test, so she never worked as a nurse. Mm-hmm. You know, she would do that. My mother uh, was very bright, and she. Uh, uh, read a lot and wrote a lot. Um, she also was very involved in church mm-hmm. with the Crucillo movement and the Lady Society. Uh, so she did that. She also did have a little job in a dry cleaning, um, uh, a place of employment, um, sewing buttons and zippers. So she knew how she she knew how to sew a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, so she would do that. And at one time, she also worked in um, a diner. Mm-hmm. And uh, she really liked that, you know, but she had to get up early and go to, at like six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and she did that for a, a number of years, you know, always trying to help out the family, you know. But, um, yeah, she 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 did quite a bit, quite a bit. But I remember back then also your dad had a little store, too. Oh, that's right. I'm and glad he's remember. Yeah. Well, it was like when I was like in kindergarten because you couldn't get the food that we were used to, Latinos, were Puerto Ricans were used to, mm-hmm. my father would occasionally go drive to New York and bring back 
uh, vianda, verdura, bacalao, abacates, um, arroz. You know, he would bring that back. So it gave him an idea to open up a little store. And so my dad worked the steel mills. My mother worked the little, a little store. What was it called? Remember? Uh, no, it was on tenth. Yeah, it was on. Yeah, it was on tenth Street. So it was probably the tenth Street store. I don't know. And um, I can remember coming, walking from church, from school. Mm-hmm. We would walk from school. My 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 three brothers and I would walk from school because my sister wasn't there yet. Uh, would walk from school, mm-hmm. and we would sit there and do our homework. Mm-hmm. And my mother would, you know, and she had a little. I remember she had a little hot plate, and she would cook there. <laughs> and then she would close it up and we'd walk home. But it didn't last. Mm-hmm. And, I, I, and you know, it was just too much with my dad working the steel mills and having to go to New York and right. get, get, get stuff, yeah. you know, get the product. So it didn't last long. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they, they, they did the best they could. And another thing, let me just add this. Um, there were times uh, in my young years that we would have three, four, five men living in our basement <laughs> because they would come from Puerto Rico and had nowhere to stay. Yeah. And and they would live with us until they could get enough money to find a place where they could bring their family. So we had people in and out all the time. And my mother cooked and washed clothes for these men. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and because of this, my parents were very um, um, loved in the community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my mom was basically an at-home mom. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad worked uh, all the while. She was involved also in the church activities, um, as Nidia mentioned. Uh, she basically was an at-home, never drove. Mm-hmm. Uh, she did not uh, learn English very much while she understands it mm-hmm. and can speak some words to this day. My mom is still living. She's 90. She'll be 97, 97 in a couple weeks. In a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she was basically home. When dad came home from work, she had the meal there. Mm-hmm. And she was um, a fabulous cook. And and that was an expectation, by the way, that that meal mm-hmm. would be there when he came home from work. Right. Um, and so she washed clothes, cleaned the house, cooked food. And that was that's what she did. And she was very happy doing and it. And she was happy doing that. She never learned to drive. She uh, never worked outside the home. She never worked outside the home. And so that, you know, yeah. That was mom, <laughs> <laughs> and still is. <laughs> Would you say, um, Nivia, did you learn to cook from your mom? Well, um, <laughs> yes, because, you know, when my mother had these little jobs at the like, dry cleaner, she mm-hmm. would say to me, um, can you start the rice or can you start the beans or, you know, and I was always watching her. Now, I'm saying this, but if you ask him, he would probably say that I was a really bad cook in the beginning. <laughs> so you taught her? Is that what you're saying? No. Oh, no. Oh, yes, yes. That's good. No, one. no, 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 no. No. It, it was a trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and deciding what I could cook because he, he is um, very limited. Um, he's not adventuresome at all when it comes to food. Mm-hmm. Not at all. But, but you know, I, over the years... It's a trial and error. You keep. That's what I keep telling. She my has daughters. become a very good cook. <laughs> she has become a very good cook. And I tell my daughters yes. that. So my oldest daughter mm-hmm. will cook a wonderful arroz con gandules, mm-hmm. arroz con pollo, carne guisa, and beans. Mm-hmm. She's great. My younger Beth, mm-hmm. my younger daughter said, "Why do I have to learn that? I have you." <laughs> and I said, and my I have a daughter in law that really tries, but. Because she fails the first time, she won't try again. Okay. And because my son doesn't encourage her, yeah. and I keep saying, "Lori, you need to keep doing it." She's not. A, she's not a Latina. She, uh, no. you know, we have so, a United Nations in our family. So <laughs> she, but she enjoys uh, her, her uh, food. Uh, her our food, you know. And so she, that's why I cook a lot. A lot of yeah. times I cook a lot, and then I have a bowl for everybody, and I deliver it. Right. <laughs> What's been interesting about. Um, um, our culture and our family is I remember not not in this community as much as in the prior community that we lived in before we bought this condo um, we were the first ones it's funny because we were the first ones there at that community, at that community. Uh, we had a big three uh, store, five story home it's a, a five level split. five level split I should mm-hmm. say 
And um, as people keep moved in, we would welcome them and we would, and then they all got used to the Latino, the Hispanic cooking. So we <laughs> broke all that community in to, and to this day, they just can't wait until she makes her rice con, uh, con uh, um, gandules or arroz con, con, uh, with chicken and rice, you know, that kind of thing. Arroz con pollo. Arroz con pollo. And she just. And they look forward to my coquito. They mm. just look forward to that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And, and we always, always have our music. We used to have um, at that home uh, parrandas. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. sometimes we had like 75 people, mm -hmm. um, you know, coming in and uh, from the, the, obviously the neighbors would all and come. And friends in the community. Friends we would from the community invite them. would invite them in and they're, you know. And one time we had a small, I think we had a small gathering here, not a parranda, but we just invited a bunch of friends over. Yeah. But not like that house. We used, that house was just, and well, the kids, the kids, our grandkids just would have a ball because they would have maracas and guiros and that, and mm -hmm. you know. But you know, we were working then, so we were we saw people going to events or whatever. Now we're retired, so we have a, we're in a different stage in mm -hmm. our life. But I don't know if you know uh, Dr. Raúl Soto. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's the one who used to bring us parandas, oh, wow. and he would always save us to the last. And I would make this this big pot of asopao de pollo. Mm -hmm. You know, and we just had really good times. We had wonderful memories, wonderful. So our children um, married non-Latinos, mm -hmm. but we always, always have Latino food. Mm -hmm. We have Puerto Rican food. We have, we play our music. Um, we speak the language. Uh, you know, we, we try to teach the kids words and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, we just continue with our culture, mm -hmm. and we, we uh, encourage the them to be proud of who they are you know you're happy we have a blended we have blended family oh, and yeah. we think it's important for them to 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 um be proud of the fact that they have a blended culture mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. right. so you mentioned a couple of uh things like parandas mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me about some of the maybe stories or traditions that your parents um sort of kept for you, like kept alive while you were growing up, and that now you see yourself continuing to do food as one of them, right? And I can't Definitely. wait. Definitely. And music. All the things that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, but, um, and music, yes. Um, so tell me uh, what other things, as I, and, and hmm. can you um, uh, tell us a little bit about the parandas, what they are, and... Um, well, I, I can remember, and I'm sure Henry will share the same thing. I can remember um, going the Christmas season, um, going to bed, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we hear all this racket. Mm -hmm. And But see, my parents, of course, always knew this, so I could always see them at Christmas time preparing things, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, having a little bit more um, drink in the house, mm -hmm. you know, having coquito. Mm -hmm. um, my mother would always have... Um, she would make um, arroz con dulce mm -hmm. or budding. Mm -hmm. You know, she would always have, although she would have it during the year too, but she would, they would prepare mm -hmm. because you never knew when you were going to get a parranda. Right. And mm -hmm. inevitably, we would be dead asleep and you'd hear the knocking and the music and everybody would get up and, you know, there is the parranda. And then those of us that could would just continue to go mm -hmm. to another house. Mm -hmm. I could also remember going to midnight mass mm -hmm. at Christmas and being very tired, but there was always a party after. <laughs> and, you know, that's what sure. you went to that. Mm -hmm. And um, in our home, we didn't do a lot of, uh, we did the three kings, but not like probably Henry did. Um, I, I'm not sure why, but I, I wasn't, I didn't grow up. I mean, the church would have the three kings and, but you know about how you put, put um, mm -hmm. a box with straw. We never really did that. I think you did though. I did. I did. I remember in Puerto Rico putting um, uh, a box under the bed with, mm -hmm. with, with straw and that, and, and its place would be a, a little item, a toy. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming here to the States and I thought that I would continue to do that and finally found out that there is this person called Santa Claus uh, <laughs> and they would be the one bringing uh, toys not oh. not not you know so so but yeah I remember as a youngster uh, thinking that I would carry that same tradition but no we don't do that anymore we, we kind of well, we, we while we celebrate the, the, the 
the a feast of the three kings, uh, January sixth. Um, we don't do we don't do the old traditions like you know what we used to do before. Mm-hmm. So because I was born in the states, I think that's why I don't have um, uh, a lot of memories of that. You, well, you know. I didn't have any memories because yeah. my parents came from from the uh, from Puerto Rico to the United States and and probably because of their exposure to or people that they were exposed to mm-hmm. that were not Latinos probably taught them about Santa Claus mm-hmm. and what you did and whatever. And I think that that tradition probably went by the wayside because I don't ever remember mm-hmm. putting a, a box with straw. Um, we just didn't celebrate that aspect. We celebrated it religiously, but not, you know, like, oh, the, they're going to bring us something. No. Yeah. And I think that that's probably the difference between being born in young in the States Mm-hmm. versus being born in Puerto Rico. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, just one more question about the parrandas. But the parrandas are uh, connected to Christmas, correct? Yes. And do they happen, um, is there specific dates or is it just the week leading up to? I think it's when or? Advent starts. <laughs> People just start celebrating. And, you know, the the parrandas have certain songs. Mm-hmm. My experience with it anyway is certain songs and aguinaldos, mm-hmm. and um, and you don't sing that during, you know, that's only at Christmas time. And I think when Advent starts, that's when the people start um, preparing, and there's always a group of musicians that, you know, they go from house to house. Mm-hmm. And because in, in, in those days in, um, in Youngstown, the community was so united and so and geographically also Mm -hmm. how easy is that to go to this house and then to that house because it's there it's on the same street and then to that house you know so you just walk there (laughs) and it's like you put your coat on you keep on going even if you have your pajamas on you just keep on going and it's a celebration Mm -hmm. and it's it's sad that you know we don't really experience that anymore right. you know we the, we talk to our our children about that our grandchildren about that and 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 our grandchildren love stories so we just tell them stories that you know we remember when we were little right. and they're just amazed by it you know yeah <laughs> yeah we uh uh in puerto rico of course they sometimes they start after then right after thanksgiving Mm-hmm. And they start, you know, oh, houses yeah. are starting to get decorated. And they go all the way through January the, the 6th yeah. uh, with parrandas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they, and here in the States, they were doing it till January the 6th. But then, uh, again, that uh, you don't see a lot of parrandas anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're far few in between. Mm-hmm. But there are some folks that still do oh, it. Oh, yeah. 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 Great. Um, so you speak English and Spanish? Yes. Did, were you always... Um, using both languages as you grew up in your family and even when you went to school or the university you both went to the university correct so i um my parents always spoke spanish Mm -hmm. um and and when once i learned english i i didn't i use both languages Mm -hmm. i used to use both languages but there was a period of time that i didn't speak in i didn't speak spanish at all Mm -hmm. i just spoke english Mm -hmm. until we started dating and we got engaged and I was going to marry him. And it's like, okay, my mother-in-law doesn't speak English. So I had to really practice uh, my Spanish. And I I have to attribute it to her that I'm much more fluent now. And so with my parents, um, as an adult, I used to speak Spanish to them, Mm -hmm. half Spanish, half English. You know, Mm -hmm. sometimes you can, you can really emphasize things when you speak in Spanish rather than English, you know, <laughs> right. so we did that. Um, I went to a nursing school versus a college. Mm-hmm. It was a hospital nursing school, and um, there were only two Puerto Ricans in, 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 in school mm-hmm. when I went there. My big sister, she was a year older than me, and me. Um, no, we, we very rarely spoke Spanish. Mm-hmm. However, she wasn't your biological sister. She no, was... big sister. You know how you have them in college. Right. You know yeah. they're older than you, and you got a big sister and mm-hmm. a little sister. And um, but when we had patients that were not um, bilingual, mm-hmm. I was always called, right. and I would always go and translate and and get my point across to mm-hmm. them. And so they used me a lot, and even in my job, um, so. Uh, the job I retired from, I was a rehab nurse with the Bureau of Workers' Comp. Mm-hmm. 
And when we had to deal with um, uh, injured workers that didn't speak English, I was asked to translate. So I did use it in my in my career. I, I did, you know. Um, and I took Spanish in school because it was easy. <laughs> Yeah, my situation was um, I basically spoke Spanish uh, coming from Puerto Rico, right. uh, learning English through school and with friends and so forth. But at home, it was basically Spanish. Mm -hmm. So I was able to maintain... Yeah, 100% of the time. I was able to maintain the Spanish language. Um, uh, and then I remember when I was then in the service that when uh, if if you when you live in Puerto Rico, if you're, you can be drafted mm -hmm. to go into the army from Puerto Rico... You can't vote for the commander in chief for the president, but you can be drafted. And so we had uh, folks come in, uh, soldiers come in from the island uh, to where I was at in training. And I would be asked to help along with their training because they didn't understand any English. Mm -hmm. And so I would help them along. And so I remember I was used in that sense. Um, so uh, but but having the two languages have always been very useful uh, for me. Um, I used to direct an agency in Youngstown, Ohio, um, and we had a lot of folks come in uh, to the agency. Uh, and so working with the employers and working with the school system to create bilingual programs and so forth, um, very useful to have the two languages. So you said you known each other from childhood. But when did you start dating? Tell me about that. <laughs> well, I maybe I can I can do that, um, and then so now he used to always call me his cousin. Oh, really? Like when he had girlfriends, we're not cousins, and we would go okay. to, we would go to dances, <laughs> and he would bring his girlfriend to the dances, but he wanted to dance with me. Oh, that, that's just my cousin. I'm going to dance with my cousin. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, so yeah, we were, we were, we were very close friends um, and sort of confidants. We would always talk about if I had an issue with a girlfriend, I would ask her, get her advice, and she always gave me the bad advice because I knew. <laughs> You now I know what her ulterior motive right. was. Back then, I didn't make that connection. Um, but when I was in Vietnam, I, I had a girlfriend, and she was in the States. And obviously, I was there. And so I found out later when I came home that she had gone out, you know. And so and we... She, and she had a boyfriend. And we... So, so we broke up. And then... Um, but in the meantime, she had been writing to me while I was in Vietnam. And I would write to her and we would write to each other and that kind of thing. And then, you know, one time we decided that we would, you know, go out. Well, and well because he called me up and said, oh, I need to talk to you. But, <laughs> but his girlfriend. So we, we did. I was in nursing school and I'd live, even though the, the hospital was five miles from my house, we had to live at the at the nursing school. Mm -hmm. And so he would pick, he picked me up from nursing school. We went for a ride. And I have to bring it back because there was this dead mother that yeah, they used, house, uh, house mother that we she had was to be very back at seven o'clock. It was a Catholic nursing school. Okay. So seven o'clock I had to be back. And and she had a big German shepherd too, right alongside her. Sheba. So. <laughs> anyway. And, yeah. So I would, I would, and I was, we were kind of afraid to tell our parents. So, so, because so then he we knew each other since we were kids. Right. So we, we, so he would, he picked me up and he says, you want to go to the movies on the weekend? I go, sure, why not? I, I don't have anything to do. And because I would go home every weekend. And so, you know, I told mom and dad, I said, and believe this or not, uh, in those days, you know, the girls, they had chaperones mm -hmm. and, you know, you couldn't go out. The boy had to come in and you couldn't go out. But I was allowed to date, believe it or not. I mean, <laughs> since I was 16, I was allowed to date. As long as it doubled My date, sisters weren't. If no, they, seriously. When my when I my sister and I graduated the same year, <clears throat> and for her prom, she had to double with me. In other words, in my date, mm -hmm. she wasn't allowed. My father would not allow her to go by herself with her date. Mm -hmm. She had to be. I I I had. It's I had, a boy. I had other privileges, but not her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then I told mom and dad, I said, oh, Henry's coming over. We're going to go to the movies or whatever. So we did. And, and then we started seeing each other. <laughs> and I think my parents knew it. it was three months later, we were engaged. Okay. <laughs> Shocked our parents. I think they kind of knew. But I was still in the service. Yeah. But, I yeah. mean, I was 19. He was 20. Yeah. And, um, and I was a junior in nursing school. And he was still had an, another year of military. 
And, um, and we told our parents and, you know, three years later we got married Mm -hmm. and this year we celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. Yeah, and we still like each other. It's twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah, we just we, 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 twenty twenty or twenty twenty. No, twenty twenty. We look oh, so look forward to this year because it was our fiftieth mm-hmm. wedding anniversary. We were taking our all our children, grandchildren to Costa Rica. Mm-hmm. We had planned it for five years, mm-hmm. and we had a a, a little. Um, uh, celebration planned at a hall with catered and we were going to dance and celebrate and we canceled it all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's well, okay. But we're all healthy. We're so. hopeful right. that in the, it, you know, once this pandemic is over, we'll be yeah, able to, absolutely. you know, yeah. Yeah, to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't know how to break it. I didn't, you know, to our, my mom, uh, you know, uh, so it, it was, it was, uh, and I remember having to go and ask her dad, for her daughter's uh, hand so that we can be engaged. And it was Christmas. It was Christmas. Cr- Christmas. Christmas Day. And I remember he's, o'clock in the morning. we were in the kitchen and he sat on that end and I sat on this end of the table, just the two of us. They were, <laughs> her and her mother were sitting, there's a wall, doorway, and they were on the side, on the other side, there was a stairway going upstairs and they were sitting on that stairway trying <laughs> yeah. to listen in. He grilled me. Like bam, 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 bam is like question after question after and question. He knew you. And he, oh, knew yeah, he knew me. He, knew, he was his brother. He knew. he knew all about me. He was just doing it, you know, because that he had to. He was patriarchal. You know, he had to do that. Finally, when I had answered all his questions to his satisfaction, mm-hmm. then he says, "Está bien, vente conmigo. Mm-hmm. Come with me." We went into the dining room, and he had this bowling ball looking thing. He opened the top, opened up. The, in the middle of it was a, a uh, whiskey bottle with little shot glasses around it. <laughs> Took two shot glasses out, drank, you know, and then it says, Seal and that's the deal. how we sealed the deal. I didn't even have to pay any cash. <laughs> 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 it was a shot. <laughs> yes. yeah. So tell me why you were afraid to tell your mother. Because we were close friends. Yeah. It's and like- it was like... You know, do I tell her that I'm engaged to Nidia? We, she knew her almost as a daughter. And and you know? I, but I have to tell you, as, as loving as she was, this was her baby, mm-hmm. and there, I don't think there was any woman that would have been good enough for him. <laughs> my, you know, um, my mother was, as her mother, very religious. Okay, um, mass, church every day. And back then, usaban las mantillas, you know, to church. They don't do that anymore. But back then, and um, when I when I went to Vietnam, um, my mother made a promesa to the Virgin Mary, and she wore a habit like Abito. a. Do you remember? You, have, are you familiar with that? Yeah. So she wore this brown habit with a a sash mm-hmm. for the whole time I was there, wow. because she made a promesa to the Virgin Mary to keep me safe. And, um, um, yeah, so. So, you know, he comes home from, from Vietnam. Well, I was wounded. I, I, uh, I was shot in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And I spent um, about 11 months or so in the hospital. And so, so. So, you know, he comes home and right away he, he gets engaged to, I didn't even know they were dating, you mm-hmm. know. And because, I mean, it was three months. Mm-hmm. We started seeing each other in September. And in December, we decided to get married, you know, to get engaged. And it's like, they were, it was like a little scary. It was a little <laughs> scary. But, you know, they were compadres. It's like, what do you do? Right. So they were very happy for us afterwards, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, you know, we promised them that we would finish doing what we were doing. And we'd have everything, you know, we we would work at it. I wasn't going to leave nursing school. Because, you know, I always knew that I was, I wanted more. <laughs> you know, my parents raised us to, to, to not have to struggle so much. And my father said, I don't want my sons working in the steel mills, mm-hmm. you know, so right. get your education. Um, so it was always, we were always encouraged mm-hmm. to go to go to school. And and um, and he had his military and, you know. Henry, were you in the Army? Yes. Okay. I was um, with the 101st Airborne. I was a paratrooper to mm-hmm. jump from the planes. Okay. How many years were you? Well, a total of three years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tell me about um, that experience of being in the Army and then going to Vietnam. Um, tell me a little bit about that. 
Well, it was 1966 um, when I remember going to Cleveland on a train to, for the physical with a friend of mine. and Because you were drafted. He, well, I got my draft notice, mm -hmm. uh, which is two-year commitment. Mm -hmm. But then I volunteered my draft, mm -hmm. which added another year. Because back then, we were told that if you went in as a draftee, you were treated differently than if you were a regular army, a three-year guy. Mm -hmm. And so I volunteered my draft, so they gave me another year. So I went in, and you weren't treated any differently than if a two-year guy. And you didn't even know who was a two-year guy and who was a three-year right. guy. So I went through all my training in the States, um, uh, airborne training, jump school, leadership classes, um, and then on to Vietnam within, uh, by January, right after January, I was, I was there. Oh, August. You were uh, how old? Oh, I was 19. Uh, 19. Mm -hmm. 19. Um, we were all young. Mm -hmm. We were all young. Um, we were sort of, of real patriotic, though. Um, Latinos by nature are patriot patriotic. Mm -hmm. We, you know, as you know, the history of the island of Puerto Rico, the 65th Infantry, the Borinconeers, mm -hmm. have the most, one of the most decorated groups. They won the, they got the Congressional Gold Medal for their exploits in during the Korean War and and all the wars, World War One, World War Two, and especially highlighted in Korean War. So I went to Vietnam, and um, being there in country for eight months, then uh, I didn't escape this one bullet that caught up to me, mm -hmm. and uh, I got shot and spent um, eleven three months in a hospital in Japan, mm -hmm. and then the rest of the time in hospitals, three different hospitals in the states, uh, because back then. Uh, uh, the stateside military hospitals were full. And so you had to wait. I had to wait three months in Japan mm -hmm. until a bed was available at a hospital near you, mm -hmm. where you lived. Mm -hmm. And so they sent me to Walter Reed, from Walter Reed to Fort Dix, from Fort Dix to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And it was then that my parents were then able uh, to see me. Right. Yeah. And then after he was discharged from the hospital, he still you still had another year to go. Yeah, I still had uh, a commitment. Uh, and so I went back. They sent me back to Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was the non-commissioned officer in charge of this John F. Kennedy Center for Sports Special Warfare. And I stayed there. Um, I got orders um, to go back to Vietnam. Um, I went to the company commander and I said, I I just, I'm out of the hospital. How can I be going back to Vietnam? Right. And the reason was, is that they wanted seasoned people. Mm -hmm. They wanted people with experience. They were losing a lot of soldiers and they wanted people with experience. And I told the company commander, this, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. So he called Washington on my behalf and I got out of it. So I didn't have to go back. Thank, right. thank goodness. Right. Right. Yeah. So finished up my tour, got out in 68. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. So tell me about, um, so you said you were engaged for three years mm -hmm. before you got married. Tell me about the wedding. Tell me, how mm. was it? Was it a Puerto Rican wedding? Oh, of oh, course. Very much so. <laughs> we had a Trio Puerto Rico play. It was a, it was a, a group. They were from Lorraine, Ohio. A, a band. And um, we were married at uh, Santa Rosa, um, five o'clock in, in the evening and then the reception we had it at a hall and we didn't have puerto rican food because we we um had caterers i didn't want my mother and my mother-in-law to have to worry about so we had caterers we had typical american food um but we had our band and uh it, it was just great i mean you know we, just we were had, hoping we were hoping that we would have um we didn't know we didn't know how much cash we would end up getting from <laughs> You know, our wedding yeah. gifts. So we, prior to that, we went and got a loan from a local loaning place mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we had enough money to go on a honeymoon. Mm -hmm. um, as it was, we ended up getting enough money. Mm -hmm. So the loan that we got, we just took it right back, mm -hmm. you know, it paid it off. and paid it off. You yeah, know. we went to the Pocono Mountains for our honeymoon. Mm -hmm. And there, coincidentally there, we met this couple from Puerto Rico. <laughs> and we said to them, 
oh my goodness, you come from the beautiful island of Puerto Rico with uh, sand and water. And you come to the Pocono Mountains? She, yeah. <laughs> and do you know that we're still friends? Oh, okay. A few years, years ago. When was it? Three so, years ago? So we kept in touch for a couple years and then we lost touch. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably about three years ago, he gets this message from this person. I said, you don't know who I am, but my parents are Jerry and Tony Amadeo, and you were on the honeymoon together, and they would love to reconnect, and we did. It was their daughter. It was their daughter. And they're in Puerto Rico? No, no. they're in, in Tennessee. Okay. <laughs> Not too far. But, but we, you know, uh, at least every couple of weeks we FaceTime or we call, and, and we just, and they visited us here, we visited them, and we just oh. reconnected, you know. Mm. We spent the whole week with them, just a week, but we became, you know, friends. Right. Yeah. That's great. Um, <clears throat> tell me about um, the, so you, you worked as a nurse, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what did, what kind of job did you have, Henry, after the military? What kind of work? Well, I came back, I was working uh, for a grocery store chain called a and P Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, mm -hmm. and um, that's what I was doing. I was stocking shelves, working there, mm -hmm. and then um, uh, there was an opportunity. In the meantime, we were working on trying to establish an agency mm -hmm. to service the Latino community, the, a growing Latino community with a variety of needs and employment and social services. So that organization was started in 1972, mm -hmm. and I was hired as the first director mm -hmm. of that agency. And um, that's where I was. And during the interim that I was in, at that agency, that's when I decided to go to college. What's the name of the agency? Organización Cívica y Cultural Hispana Americana. Mm -hmm. And they say OCA. Mm -hmm. uh, Which is in that book. It's in that, in that book that we gave you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what I did. Um, and then uh, I think it was, uh, when was it that Governor Celeste uh, so, so, came to town? Um, Probably in 82. Okay, yeah. In about 83. 80, I think it was 82 83. or 83. Uh, the governor of the state uh, had this program called Capital for a Day, where he would take his whole cabinet to different cities across Ohio mm -hmm. so that the communities would learn who the different directors were of the different agencies. And then he would have like town, town hall meetings. Well, he, they came to Youngstown. Mm -hmm. I addressed the governor mm -hmm. at a forum related to the issues that were impacting our community. Right. So he came, he left, and I don't know, uh, maybe a year later or six months later, I get a call from his chief of staff mm -hmm. saying, the governor was impressed with your presentation. Mm -hmm. He wants to know if you, if you want to work for him. Mm -hmm. And so that was a decision. Uh, we lived all our lives, both it of us. It was a big decision to leave yeah. our families. You know, I saw my parents almost every day. Mm -hmm. It was a big, a big decision. But we had to think about the future of our children because mm -hmm. during the previous, I don't know how many years, the steel mills closed down. Mm -hmm. Youngstown lost a lot of industry. Mm -hmm. We thought about our children's future. Mm -hmm. And as hard as it was, that's what we were thinking of. Mm -hmm. Plus his future. You know, he worked at Oka. I mean, how long could you work there? Although here it is, what, 40 some years and it's still in existence. And so it was just a real, a real, a good opportunity for him and for our children. Mm -hmm. But we sat down, we sat down, we brought all the kids together. We all discussed it. You know, this is an opportunity that's come up because they would have to, you know, leave their friends. Um, and our oldest daughter at that time was 13. Yeah. And, you know, um, to leave your friends. And, and one thing that we always do, we always discuss things as a family mm -hmm. and we listen to the inputs and, and, um, and our children are so wonderful that whatever we say, they agree. But with, every, you know, every but, move that we've made, um, has been a table discussion about, you know, let's, let's talk it out. How do you feel about it? You know? Um, and we had a discussion about, it. but anyway, came to Columbus, mm -hmm. uh, to work for the governor. And um, he um, he served two terms. Um, I, I served in different positions. I came to be the deputy director of the state and local government commission. Then I became deputy director of liquor control for the state of Ohio under his administration. He then leaves out of office because he couldn't run anymore. Mm -hmm. 
I then go to work for a short time period with the attorney general's office, uh, Lee Fisher. Um, then a friend of mine who I knew from, from uh, Columbus got a job in Cleveland mm -hmm. uh, to become um, director of public service. I get a call, hey, do you want to be my deputy? So again, another meeting, another meeting family with the family, meeting. because again, they're going to, we're going to displace the kids, you know? Well, at that time, we, it was just two children yeah. we were going to displace. And Becky, the oldest, was working. She was 21. She was 21. Our son, our son was 19, and he was at Ohio University, mm -hmm. and so the younger two. So um, we made the move back Beth, to- Beth was in 10th grade. Wow. <laughs> made the move to to uh, to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. um, didn't know where we were going to stay. As a matter of fact, you stayed behind. Did you stay? Yeah. Yeah, she stayed I, behind. To sell our home. To sell a home that we had here. I went to Cleveland. I stayed with different friends for a while until we found an apartment. Mm -hmm. um, then we found a place that was building homes, new homes, but they were property tax abated. In other words, there was a 15-year property tax abatement so we didn't have to pay property taxes where that we built this home mm -hmm. so, and it was in cleveland proper so it was in cleveland brand new home so but in the meantime i lived in this apartment then they came up uh the my my beth and my uh son matthew and nidia and we stayed in this two-bedroom apartment <laughs> for like six months for like six months while the home was being built mm -hmm. and you know, did that. And I worked in Cleveland. We worked in Cleveland. She was able to transfer to a job from the state mm -hmm. uh, to Cleveland. Um, I was in the Department of Public Service for X number of years. Well, you then became director. And they, I then became director of that department. Mm -hmm. And then um, the director, then the guy that had become, that was the director that hired me, became the director of public safety. He then moves on to children's services, and the mayor asked me to become the director of public safety. Mm -hmm. So then I moved into that position. I think total time was there 10 years, 11 years, something like that in, in Cleveland. Now we have a new mayor coming in, and I'm always where all these positions were at the pleasure of who, the elected official. Mm -hmm. So a new mayor comes in. Um, she says that she wants to get someone else as public sa safety director, but wants me to stay on in the administration. Mm -hmm. So I go to the Department of, of, of uh, Equal Opportunity and become the director of that department. But I told her, I says, this isn't something that I want to do. I'm looking. She says, that's fine. Just let me know. And just, you know. So I get a call from Mayor Coleman in Columbus because <laughs> he just got elected. And they're looking for a director of public utilities. Mm. And um, I get a call from the chief of staff, his chief of staff. Um, I come down to Columbus. I interview for the utilities. I get a call back in Cleveland. They say, well, I got good news and bad news. You're not going to get the utilities job, but the mayor wants you to become his director of public service. So again, another meeting with the family. <laughs> <laughs> but we were coming home right. because Columbus was our home. We had so. been here before already. Yeah. So we came back and, and, um, and, uh, when was that? In, 80, in 2004. 2004. Came back to Columbus. Worked for the city of Columbus as public service director. And then uh, Governor Strickland won as governor in 07. I was asked to become the director of public safety for the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I was on his cabinet as director of public safety until I retired in 09. She retired before I did. I he didn't like jealous. it that she was retired and I wasn't. <laughs> So I retired in 09, and um, to this, to here we are today. Mm -hmm. Henry, well, you've done a lot of jobs or work within the government, mm -hmm. but and but you started with an organization that was serving the Latino community specifically. Yes, yes, yes. Tell me what about this involvement, not only with that organization, but also like later on, were you able to do any kind of work supporting or advocating for the Latino community? Um, in Columbus or in Cleveland? Always. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Always. Uh, uh, um, in every position I've had, I've always been, I never forgot where I came from. Mm -hmm. Because we was either opening doors for others to come in. To hire, I've always hired folks from the community to work for me mm -hmm. at every job. 
Um, I served on the various boards uh, in the community, uh, both in Youngstown. I ran for school board. I was a school board mm -hmm. member, the first Latino on the school board at that time. Uh, I ran for the school board um, several times, and then I was appointed, and then I ran and got elected. Um, I remember it's an interesting story because uh, two weeks before that, I was doing a play-by-play -play for my son's Pee Wee Football League, mm -hmm. and it was up on the scaffolding, and um, it was raining, it was wet, they had these chairs that opened up, and I went to sit down after making this play, and I fell backwards off of the scaffold, landed two weeks before, I ended up a week in the hospital, and now I came you out of the hospital, hand. broke my hand, I had to come out and uh, try to campaign, I'm still in pain, I remember election day, I had to go work the polls and I was in pain. I went home and I said, I can't do this. I'm just gonna go home and went to bed. I go home, went to bed. And next thing you know, it was late at night. Oh, it was probably midnight. Midnight, people pounding, pounding on, on my door, door. <laughs> I won. We thought it was a paranda. <laughs> <laughs> so here I had won the election. So I've always been involved in trying to give back to the community. I now serve here in, in, uh, for the American Red Cross. I'm on their board, but I also actively involved in trying to increase the donation of blood mm -hmm. from our community because uh, nationwide, Latinos hold 60% of Latinos are the old blood, and the old negative blood is universal blood type. Right. So we're trying to increase donation of blood from the Latino community. But both her and I also served as that team member, disaster. Team members for the Red Cross, for the Red Cross we did responding that for a number of years. responding to local disasters, mm -hmm. um, um, and she she went out with me. I was a team leader, and, and then I was she, a medical person, and she was the medical person for the team. So, um, and just the other day, someone called me about something that they needed. Um, I'm always trying to help wherever I can. You only live once in this life, and you got to make it sure that when you leave, you leave it better than what it was. Mm -hmm. And so I, we, we both try to help out whenever we can. Yeah. What about you, Nidia? Did you also get involved in the Latino community in different, in different ways? Well, not separate from him. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I was always his support, you mm -hmm. know, and we, we worked together on it. Um, uh, um, well, we had small kids, so she was well, always... True. Well, when mm -hmm. we lived in Youngstown... You know, we had four small children, mm -hmm. and if he was out and about, you know, I was. But she did what you did. You did get involved in a program with with the. Um, I, I don't know if it was part of LULAC or the women. Remember, you had the meeting. yes, and it didn't. It didn't last very long. I can't even remember the name of it now. But <laughs> but we would have our meetings, and we were trying to encourage women to come in. I know there's an awful lot of organizations out there. You know, like there's a. The Latina Mentoring Academy, mm -hmm. what Beth is very involved in, and there's other other groups there. Um, I'm always there to support mm -hmm. if they need something. I'm not involved in it, but I'm always there to support mm -hmm. if something's needed. You know, we, we provide. Big brothers, big sisters. Yeah. Um, we had an event here. We're, uh, we're big supporters of Big Brothers. Big try sisters. to help out uh, Elizabeth Martinez, yeah. who's a director. We had a fundraiser for, here. We you know, we donate for the camp. You know mm -hmm. and. So we we are we are um, we're trying to stay involved as much as we can, uh, understanding that we're as we get older we have other we have medical issues that probably prevent us from doing as much as we would like, but we still try to do mm -hmm. wherever we can. Mm -hmm. um, Nivia and and Henry, um, so you you told me a little bit about your fam your own family life and growing up uh, with. Um, you know, keeping the Puerto Rican traditions and uh, culture and also some of the language. How was that like with your own family, with your own kids? With How our children? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, they all understand Spanish, but they will not speak it. Our oldest though. Uh, Becky, Becky does speak it. She reads it, reads it, writes it. Um, and I think it's because uh, I worked when she was little and my mother watched her. Uh, the other children are mad at us. Um, but because, I, I know I'm making excuses here, but because as I grew up, I chose to speak English. It was harder for me as a, as a married couple family for me to speak the language to my children. I'm not saying that I didn't, I did. And, and so they understand it. And we always, you know, they always went to, to mass and 
they were around their grandparents who spoke Spanish. So they understand it, but they won't speak it. Now, our grandchildren are very interested in learning Spanish. Mm-hmm. And we have one that I think um, her parents are going to get her that babble. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's really interested in speaking Spanish and, and the other kids too. And so we're always saying words to them and, and, um, explaining them. you know, if we say something, explaining things to them, I know I'm terrible. We're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, um, that's one regret, I guess. That yeah. I had a regret that uh, we didn't do that with them. Um, although having said that, we do try to, uh, make sure that they understand the culture mm-hmm. and to, to keep the culture alive. Um, um, whether from their side of the, of the, their, either their, uh, father's side or, you know, uh, um, but it's important that, that we keep the culture alive. So that they, we, you know, they, they like, and, they, love and they like to hear stories. They, they like love, to hear stories of our youth right. and, and, and they love our parents and that kind of thing. Yeah. They love the fact that they're half Puerto Rican. I mean, they, and they're very proud of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, we, we always talk about, you know, um, when we were kids and, and they just sit around and they, and even, and we have quite, we have a few that are adults now and they still love it. They, they love gathering together. They love being together. And, uh, you know, we're, we have 10 (laughs) from 12 to 22. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So, and when we get together, we have a good time. We Mm -hmm. have a good time. They love being together. We take family vacations and there's not one fight. Imagine, mm-hmm. 20 Amazing. people. Yes. Yes. Um, so education, you said for you growing up was important. Very Your important. Parents pushed you, you know, to not, um, like most of our parents, to have better jobs, better you know, um, mm-hmm. uh, opportunities than they had. Um, what was it for your own kids? Did they all, you know, was, was that the expectation? Oh, the, the expectation was there. No doubt about it. Um, and because we were professionals too. Mm-hmm. So they saw that, um, our oldest daughter went to Ohio state and it, it was at the time when we moved to Cleveland mm-hmm. and she was working and she was going to school and she just felt she couldn't do both. Mm-hmm. So she dropped out. But since then she has gotten a degree. Mm-hmm. And then our, uh, our, our second child, the son is a teacher. He got a teaching degree. He doesn't work as a teacher. He, he, he went to, uh, Cleveland state mm-hmm. and, um, he is a director of training for an insurance company. Mm-hmm. And then Matthew said, don't waste your money on me. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to college. Mm-hmm. So forget it. So, but he, he was an EMT mm-hmm. for, and for the city of Cleveland and, and did that for 12 years or whatever and got injured on the job and couldn't go back. Mm-hmm. And he's a phlebotomist now. He, he works in a doctor's office. And then that. You know, she went to um, Bowling Green and she got her master's at Case mm-hmm. and and she works now at OSU Wexner Center. Um, so, yes, we've encouraged, we always encourage our kids to go to college. However, I'm encouraging my grandchildren, some of them, you don't have to go to college, but get a trade because we need trade people. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So you know, far, try to get, try to get a plumber, or electrician. You have to wait months, you know. So far, every one of the ones that have graduated from high school are in college. Mm-hmm. Um, so so our, one of them, the oldest is going to graduate in, from May. My, in May from Miami of Ohio. Ohio. Um, and her sister is is uh, a sophomore at Ohio State, mm-hmm. and so she'll be a junior. Um, and then who's the next one? Then um, Lola is at uh, Ohio State Newark. Mm-hmm. She's a freshman. And then Gabby, which is our son's uh, other son's daughter, started taking college classes in ninth grade. <laughs> Wow. And so when she graduated last year, she was one credit short of having an associate's degree. Wow. Mm-hmm. But she's at Bowling Green. Mm-hmm. And so she just finished her first semester and she's a junior. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So she's going to be a marine biologist. She wants to be a marine biologist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, we talked to Yolanda Cepeda mm-hmm. and she's encouraging her to, to sign up for the summer research program. Right. Yeah. 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 So we're hoping she gets it, you know. Mm-hmm. And so we have four kids in college, and then we have two graduating now in in May, and one just got accepted at Bowling, or uh, uh, got offers from um, Baldwin Wallace Mm -hmm. and Wittenberg, and he hasn't decided where he wants to go. Football. Okay. Big but it's also academic. I mean, he's, yeah, he got, he's got, a, he got, he got an, an academic, academic scholarship, scholarship for both schools. Yeah. 
but yeah. he hasn't decided which one he wants to go to. And then the other, the other grandchild uh, is a girl. She just got a scholarship to Lorraine Community College. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 you know, up to three years that she, she goes. So she just got that. So she's going to, I don't know what she wants to do. She wants to be, uh, you go into um, radiology or, mm-hmm. you know, something. So, yeah. So we've encouraged them all to go to college, mm-hmm. but we're starting to tell them, you know, you if you don't want to go to college, you know, like our, our granddaughter with Lorraine Community mm-hmm. College, if you don't want to like be a teacher or something, and she's interested in radiology, become an x-ray technician. You mm-hmm. can become a CAT scan person, you can become an uh, mm-hmm. MRI or a mammogram. Or I had a pacemaker put in last year. The doctor was there, but do you know who surrounded oh, them? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're technicians. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can, the world is out there for you. Mm-hmm. So um, even though we, we encourage them so that they could have an easier life to find a job, mm-hmm. we encourage them to further their education, but it doesn't have to be college, it could be trade mm-hmm. school, it could be, you know, technical school or whatever. Mm-hmm. Henry, so mm-hmm. I just saw a picture of, <laughs> of at the post office. The, <laughs> the wanted <laughs> of, of you with President Obama. Yes. And then yesterday you had a chance to be on a Zoom call, of course, it's 2020, uh, with uh, President elect Biden. Yes. Tell me about this what these things were about, this meetings were about, and um you know, and how, how how you got to be part of it. Well, I've always been involved. I always felt that this country uh, gave us a lot and we need to give back. So I always encourage people to register to vote and vote. And so I've always been involved in helping candidates out in elections. So uh, going back when I was with the Department of Public Safety, I mentioned the program that we, we put together to encourage uh, our employees to to make sure that we wrapped our arms around those that were serving our country Mm -hmm. from the department. So we developed this program and that program got nominated uh, for the Freedom Award. Mm -hmm. So we did. We we, the department got the Freedom Award and my wife and I, Nidia and I, Nidia and I and and Mm -hmm. Beth went to Washington um, for the ceremony that they had. And as a matter of fact, uh, 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 Jill Biden was the speaker speaker at at the ceremony that we had in Washington. And then part of the program was that we would meet with the president. Um, and there was uh, 10 other, um, nine other uh, companies that were selected or agencies. And um, individually, uh, we met with the president and um, that was that picture that you saw. Mm-hmm. And then also there was a group photo. Uh, I have those, I can show you those. And then in this election, I, I, I think it was so important that we did something to try to make sure that we get this country back on track. Mm-hmm. And so I ca- became involved with the Biden campaign mm-hmm. and I was an alternate uh, delegate to the convention. Of course, that would have been in Milwaukee, both Nidia and I were gonna go, mm-hmm. but because of the pandemic, uh, there was no convention. Mm-hmm. And so I, would, I, I stayed involved organizing, did some video for the campaign, uh, which aired nationwide uh, on behalf of Biden and then I get an email the other day, earlier in the week, saying you've been selected to be on a Zoom call with the president. And so that's that's how that happened. And so, you know, yeah. Wow, that's great. So you mentioned, um, you know, we're in, we're in this middle of the pandemic still that started, you know, this earlier this year here in the States anyway. Tell me about um, how, what kind of things, um, how are you personally impacted by it? Um, and this could be, it doesn't have to be an illness, obviously, but maybe, um, you know, uh, family, how, how has it dis- disrupted maybe family life? Obviously, you mentioned you had to cancel your anniversary uh, celebration, you know, travel that you, that you had planned. Um, so tell me about what that has been for you, this experience, or, you know, we're still in it um, of this uh, pandemic. This well, on a personal level. Um, as Nidia mentioned, we're a close knit family mm-hmm. and we like gatherings. We like to get together. We like to hug each other. Uh, we're a h- hugging family. Mm-hmm. Latinos in nature like to hug. Yeah. And so that has curtailed a lot of that, um, socializing with friends, um, on a personal level, but then on a more professional level, everything that we do now has to be via, 
uh, Zoom uh, meetings. And so sometimes I think you lose something in the personal interaction between folks when you're doing those uh, meetings by Zoom versus uh, uh, face-to-face um, where you can sense if this is going right, you know, the meeting is going in the direction that you'd like it to go. So that that has caused some things like that. Um, and then in general, where you're kind of, you know, sequestered, trying to stay away from folks so that you don't contaminate them or they don't contaminate you. So those add uh, a certain amount of anxiety. You know, medically, because I'm a medical person, I truly believe everything that's being said by by the mm-hmm. experts. And so <clears throat> as much as it, it hurts me to not spend a lot of time with my children and grandchildren, I understand this is temporary mm-hmm. and that maybe it'll be another year. But as long as we stay healthy, um, uh, that's all that really counts. Now, I, 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 I'm a spiritual person. I love going to mass. And so that has put a, a damper on things, even though every Sunday we sit here and we watch mass on TV. Um, we've gone to church a couple times physically. Um, I'm still not real comfortable with that. I mean, we, we don't go anywhere. We go to the grocery store. Mm-hmm. We may have to run to Lowe's for a minute, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Uh, so I feel not going to church really impacts me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know, it's, again, it's it's temporary. And I know that, you know, soon we'll be, um, be able to do that. And in the meantime, we have to stay healthy because otherwise you just never know. You know, we are older. Um, and we do have some medical issues. And, and even though we feel fine, we're at risk Mm -hmm. and our children know it, our grandchildren know it. And we just, um, have to, um, just follow the rules. Our mom, my mom was here, uh, for the month, this past month of November. Mm -hmm. Um, and she basically was here, you know, we, um, he went for a walk with her a couple I, nice days. I would take he her, would you know, walk. for a walk. Um, but, you know, again, concerned because of her age, right. you know, and while she's healthy, uh, she, she's uh, going to live to a hundred. She, she, she has never been other than to have babies. Probably she hasn't been to the hospital maybe one time. Yeah. You know? She's really healthy. So, um, it was a concern. And, and so I think this pandemic has, you know, and in one sense, I think it, it brought, while it kind of separated families, I think it brought families together too, mm-hmm. because I think I think there's an appreciation for family mm-hmm. uh, because of what the because of the pandemic. Um, you, and so, you see more concern, at least within our family. There's more concern. Mm-hmm. Our kids call us every day anyway, but it's like they're really concerned. What are you doing? You're not doing that. I'll do that for you. You know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But you know, they're just at risk as much as anyone else. Mm-hmm. Although. Our adult children, except for Matthew, who works in a, a doctor's office, um, are, they work from home. Mm-hmm. And our grandchildren, some of them are hybrid. Um, and, I, and I believe in the schools because they disinfect the schools and they encourage hand sanitizer. I think they're pretty safe. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's the other things of going out, hanging out with your friends, right. going to games and, you know, practices and stuff. And our grandchildren are doing that, but they're being very careful. Mm-hmm. But... You know, you just have to pray. I'm a prayerful person, and you just have to pray that, you know, it all works out. So how do you manage your day-to-day activities, being at home every day with 24 hours a day, seven (laughs) days a week? Together. You know, we've been been like this for 12 years, because we both retired 12 years ago. we had a lot of practice already, so, <laughs> so the pandemic is just one of those other things that it's there, but we, we kind of got used to hanging out a lot together. Well, um, you know, and one of the But things- we truly do love each other, so I think that's critical. That's <laughs> right. important. And we like so, each other. Yes. Um, and But, you know, we, before the pandemic, our dates, when we were dating, a lot of it was going to movies, so mm-hmm. that's something that we always enjoy. There were, There were times that we would go after we retired and before the pandemic, we would go to the movies two and three times a week. Mm-hmm. We would pick $5 Monday mm-hmm. or senior 
<laughs> Tuesday. See you and, Tuesday. And we'd go to the movies and then we'd go and have lunch because mm-hmm. we'd go early in the morning. Or we'll go lunch. out to dinner with friends. Or, yeah, you know. or, or we have cookouts. Mm-hmm. You know, we had this patio right here and we sit out there and, hey, I want a glass of wine. Come over. So they, we'd sit and talk or we'd call our neighbors and say, we're having happy hour. Come down. And so, you know, and we have uh, lifelong friends. And like I have, I still a friend um, that lives here that from nursing school. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we were 18 when we met and now we're that age. Mm-hmm. And so we've been friends a long, long time. And but we don't see each other anymore. Um, yesterday was her husband's birthday. So we went to the driveway and sang happy birthday to him. Mm -hmm. with our masks on, Mm -hmm. you know, so you have to make the best you can with that. We don't go out to dinner anymore. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we order in, but I do most of the cooking. Um, What do we do? Oh, we watch Hallmark movies, Mm -hmm. Christmas movies. He's starting to like them. I've never seen more Hallmark Hallmark movies. He's starting to like them. Oh, goodness gracious. Yeah, we do that. Um, similar. Yeah, yeah, I noticed. <laughs> yeah, and but, sometimes it's like the same actors. But there's no f bombs and there's no violence, and you just sit there and go, "Oh, you know." You know when we when um we decided, um, I've always wanted um, a place uh, in Florida, and wanted to buy a a, a home there, as uh, you know, to go there and stay and still have a place here, but mm-hmm. you know. So we compromised. She never wanted that. So we compromised and we bought a motorhome. Mm. Um, that was, what year was that, honey? Oh, we've been doing that for like 10 years. Okay, so we bought a motorhome. First, b- bought a smaller one. Mm-hmm. And then that, we traveled back and forth. Uh, it's been winters in Florida. Mm-hmm. And then that got kind of small, so we bought a bigger one. Mm-hmm. Um, and now... And we would take our grandchildren camping locally yeah. in the summertime. Right. There were times we had eight of them. Mm-hmm. And we'd go camping, and they remember that. You know, they're a little sad now because we're selling our camper. So we're selling the motorhome. Um, it's on the market. We bought a condo in Florida, so now we have that. But but in the early years when we were when the kids were young, uh, our vacations we used to wait until we get our tax mm-hmm. refund, right. so then we could take a vacation. That's the only vacation we took with the kids. And it was always a camping, a camping trip because we couldn't afford a hotel. We couldn't f- afford hotels, so we would we would go camping with the kids, um, and that's what we that's where our vacation. So camping, uh, and they used to love that, and so uh, and they, they, they used do. to like the outdoors. The grandkids still love oh, it. They love it. They're, they're really upset that we're not going to be camping anymore. Right, yeah. and you would you weren't able to do it this summer either because of the yeah. No, oh, actually, mm-hmm. we went in June because they opened the campground. Mm-hmm. And it was going to be our last. We told them, it says, this is the last hurrah because we're selling it. And we did go and they opened up the, and they were very, you couldn't go into the, the office. You mm-hmm. had to stay in your own camper. You couldn't use the facilities, you know, all that stuff. And so we went camping and had a ball. I think we had six kids mm-hmm. and had a ball. And Beth came up and spent uh, mm-hmm. a, a couple days with us. And But now we have a, an RV uh, a condo down in Florida mm-hmm. that's a family condo. So it's open to our kids to come at any time. And then we're going to spend winter down there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know. And I know you also have been doing TikTok videos. <laughs> I know. So that's another way that you, you're keeping energy. <laughs> well, and keeping us energy. Well, you know, Beth comes up with the ideas. And then it's like, okay, we can do that. Did you like the breakfast one? I don't remember. Well, which one I you'll have to go back and look at it. That's probably the best one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? I think humor and trying to keep people uh, happy with humor, especially if they're sequestered in their homes and they don't have any other uh, way to 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 make themselves, you know, happy. I think bringing bringing joy to someone, whether it's me being silly, doing those kind of things. And the the, the thing about it is, I've had people because you know I'm I was director of most of my jobs have been the director, mm-hmm. and I get these emails. We didn't know that about you. you know? well, he always had this face on him. You know. You know? Like, I said, well, you know there what? There were times that I would say to him, you should look in a mirror and see what your face is like. And then he would. Because <laughs> he was dealing with, you know, some ordinance. Yeah. But you know what? It's it's Life is short. And, and, and you have to enjoy yourself while you're at it. Mm-hmm. And I think making people laugh and, and, and whether it's helping someone um, that you can or making them ha- laugh, that, that's important mm-hmm. to me. Anyway, and to us. 
Do you feel, Henry, with your experience in government, do you feel like we've received or that the government has done a good job with handling or keeping us informed about the pandemic and precautions and things like that? Um, what's your feeling with that? I think that there are areas in our community that uh, people still don't don't get the right information. Um, um, uh, and the more the less someone has, if they don't have the technology, they don't have the wherewithal, they don't get the information. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's still room to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, there's a lot of effort out there in our community, government agencies, and to, to reach out to folks, mm -hmm. to let them know that this is what you need to do. Um, and so for the most part, I think we're doing a fairly good job, but there's still more that can be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so in thinking about all this, your lifetime of being here in, in Ohio for both of you, what are some of the maybe most memorable moments uh, of you uh, growing up here and then growing a family here and establishing yourselves as professionals and all, all you know, so many things? Um, are, is there a couple of things that maybe stand out to you as, um, you know, something key um, and it can be professionally or personally. Well, I I personally think the I think probably one of the best um, best uh, memorial things is uh, memorable things is our our move to Columbus mm -hmm. in the 1980s mm -hmm. um, because that really set the tone for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that if we had stayed in Youngstown, we wouldn't have had good lives, mm -hmm. definitely. And we probably would have been just as involved in a smaller sense mm -hmm. uh, in Youngstown. Um, but having moved here in the 1980s, I think, at least for me anyway, it opened up my profession. Mm -hmm. um, I would have worked in the hospital um, in Youngstown, um, whereas I worked at a state agency, I, you know, I got a job with the state agency and I became, um, more knowledgeable in that field. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it opened the doors for our children. Um, uh, they learned a lot more, you know, it just, you know, living in Columbus, there's, there's so many different people. And I just think that that, that's probably, um, one of the memorable things. What do you think? Well, I think the um, my work in, in Youngstown with mm -hmm. the agency mm -hmm. uh, was was gratifying. I think when you saw uh, that someone ended up being served, um, that that to me was personally gratifying. Uh, while we weren't making a lot of money doing it, um, it was that gratification that you knew that someone got the help mm -hmm. that they needed. As Nidia mentioned, then moving on to to the state level, you had opportunities to have a bigger impact. Mm -hmm. Um, working with organizations across the state, uh, whether it was safety, whether it was um, um, uh, liquor control, whether it was local government affairs, where you're working with cities and municipalities and how to interact with the state, um, I, I, and, th and then connections with the with the federal government, um, connections with with uh, all different parts of the state, and working with different agencies. Um, I think that 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 to me uh, was important. And then I go back to um, I think what made me uh, uh, open my eyes was Vietnam, mm -hmm. my military career. Mm -hmm. That that taught me a lot of uh, lessons in uh, working together as a team, mm -hmm. uh, understanding that someone uh, you depended upon other people, mm -hmm. uh, whether you were here in rank or down here in rank that you needed them and they needed you. So when I became a director of an agency, I remembered that uh, every person in that organization uh, was an integral part of the organization. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter if they were sweeping the floor or they were up here in the director's office. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody had to be treated with respect uh, and dignity. And um, I think that that was important to me as a person. And also um, that, you were there to serve the public. Um, at the end of the day, I would go home knowing that I, that that's what I did. I served the public and I slept well because that's what was important uh, to me anyway. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those were lessons that I, um, in my government jobs, but also 
uh, from the lessons that we learned from our parents. Mm -hmm. They were hardworking. Uh, they worked hard every day to put food on the table, to put a shelter over your head. And so that carried on with us as we grew and had our own families. Um, so that, and we, we taught them the value of ed an education, mm -hmm. how important that was, and try to give them the direction that they needed and left them to make their decisions, but we gave them some directions. On, you know. So personally, um, uh, uh, it's not one instance uh, with our family, but sometimes we, Henry and I sit back and just look at them. Mm. I mean, they're all together, and it could very well be little Henry sitting on his uncle's lap or one of the girls sitting on an aunt's lap. They don't care. They just intermingle. They just know that they're loved. We sit back and think, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. You know, we started, we started and look, look at this. We have wonderful in-law children. I don't consider them in-laws. They're my children. And um, so, so I guess in our life, the most memorable things are family. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's we are we are truly truly blessed. <laughs> well, you know, it's um, our parents didn't have much. You know, um, they worked hard, mm -hmm. but they couldn't give what we have given to our kids because they didn't have it. Okay, they didn't have to to give, uh, and so um, we have been very we have been blessed uh, with good jobs. And so I think it's important that when folks like us make it to a certain level, that we continue to give back to the community wherever we can. Mm -hmm. We can't forget where we came from because she used to, I remember the kids' uh, jumpers that they had, she used to cut the, the, the toe feet off the so that, pajamas. So that they, so they another could child could have them because we didn't have much back then. No, we so really, we, we, think, really... we think back on those days of where we came from, what our parents had to go through. Um, you know, when, when, when the mills shut down, um, and they had these strikes, our parents work, went to the farms to work and bring, uh, to work in the farms. And they used to come home with, with, with potatoes or whatever to help feed the family. And so we remember that we had some hard times. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we're truly blessed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate thing is that there are still families out there to this day. They do not have and have never been able to get out of that rut that they've been in mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And so we have to try to help those folks mm -hmm. that don't have what we have. So you've been here um, all, all of your lives. What um, changes have you seen? Um, and this is specific to the Latino community. What, what growth have you seen in terms of um, not only the number of Latinos, that, I mean, that has changed significantly, uh, but also services, involvement, opportunities. What what have you witnessed as a, you know, in, in your years of, of living and growing here in Ohio? Well, um, at one time I was the only person in public service in the state of Ohio. Uh, now there are others. Mm -hmm. You know, there are there have been judges that have been mayors. I'm not mayors, I'm sorry, there have been judges, there have been uh, uh, law directors. Her brother was a law director in the city of, uh, of yes. Youngstown. Mm -hmm. um, there have been judges in, in Toledo. Um, there have been uh, uh, different, different council people, council members of council, members of the school board, mm -hmm. um, at the, even at the state level. There is a Latina on the state level. So in that sense, there has been growth, not only in here, but also in other cities like Lorraine and Cleveland and, and Toledo, uh, Columbus, uh, Cincinnati. We have a, con a, a person, a state rep um, from uh, the Dayton area. Um, uh, we have a city councilwoman up in, uh, in Cleveland. So there have been now, there's more that should be done and we need to get more of our folks to run for office. Mm -hmm. I think and I think really that's where where the rubber meets the road is because we have to be at the table uh, in order to make an impact on our community. Mm -hmm. And we have to open doors for our folks. So while there have been changes, there's still a lot oh, to a be lot, done, a lot. a lot more to be done. Mm -hmm. In the last, in 2016, um, uh, half of the Latinos that were registered to vote did not vote. Mm -hmm. Half. So they stayed home. They didn't vote. 
We're waiting to see what happened in this election. We did a lot of work to try to get the folks out to vote, but we're, the data is not in yet. So I'm curious to see how that data is. Okay. So there's still a lot more work to be done uh, by, by a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I always end with this, with this question. Uh, what does Ohio mean to you? What does Ohio mean to you? You can take a minute. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, it's always going to be home. Mm -hmm. Even though I have been out of Youngstown uh, for almost 40 years, mm -hmm. I still consider that home. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Youngstown's in Ohio. Um, you know, the weather, the, the change in seasons. I'm not real crazy about winter, but I love <laughs> fall. And I love spring, and Ohio is the best place for the four seasons. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. And, you know, it's just home. It's where my friends are, and my memories mm -hmm. are here. Um, well, I mean, Ohio is what gave our parents the opportunity. You know, they came from uh, Puerto Rico uh, to raise the families here in the great state of Ohio. It's always been home. Mm -hmm. um, it's given us an opportunity to be educated. It's given our our children an opportunity to be educated, and now it's educating our we're educating our grandchildren here in this great state. So um, it, it's a wonderful place to live. Um, it's you, you don't it's not it's not a, a big state like uh, you know New York State. Um, you don't have all the uh, hassle bassle of, of other places, but it's 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 got a lot of culture, a lot of cultural events, entertainment, um, and places to sight sights to see. Um, but it's it's what made us. Um, we've poured our lives into this state and different uh, uh, venues, and so uh, I'm, we're just so happy to be here. But we love our island. We love Puerto Rico. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there, we've been back several times. Great, great. Uh, is there anything else you would like to add to this interview, this conversation mm. about your work or your your mm. culture, anything? Well, I, I, I just think that um, um, whenever, I've always said that whenever there's an opportunity to, to help someone, um, when a Latino makes it to a certain level uh, and is in a position that they're able to help other folks, that don't forget uh, where you came from. Mm -hmm. to keep those doors open so others can come in or to extend the hand and bring them in um, and just open that door and uh, help as much as you can. Mentor as much as you can. I think that's important. Um, so I'd like to leave you with that thought because we need to, um, uh, the future is, is our, our children, our, our grandchildren, and we need to help as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this conversation. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome.